In this first of a two-part Stories from the Strong Room, we look at the Delapole family, in particular William Delapole and the foundations that William laid for the rest of the Delapole family. It was through William's financial and later political importance that saw William become arguably the biggest financier to King Edward III, and with it William climbed the political ladder, setting the Delapole family on their way to the highest offices in medieval England. In part two, which will be released later on in the series, we look at William's son, Michael Delapole, and his rise to prominence, this time under King Richard II, before his, and with it, the Delapole family's eventual downfall and their retreat into the pages of history. William Delapole rose to prominence as a merchant and royal moneylender. Using Hull as his base, William became not only an influential and wealthy merchant through imports of wine and exports of wool and corn, his wealth also allowed him to provide financial assistance to Edward III's wars with Scotland and France. The height of William's activity was during the reign of Edward III, in which he acted as a significant royal moneylender, gaining political influence, resulting in William becoming Hull's first mayor in 1331 and Baron of the Exchequer in 1339 to 1340. Although loyal to the crown, William found himself in hot water with Edward III, but did manage to come away somewhat unscathed, laying the foundations for the Delapole family dynasty. Tradition has it, William, along with his brothers Richard and John, came from Ravensay on the Spain Peninsula. Although we are unable to say for certain where William and his brothers came from, it is likely they were from the East Riding, and possibly even Hull itself. By 1316, William and Richard were firmly established Hull merchants. They were most likely burgesses of the town, and were probably a first generation of a largely undistinguished family to reach such a position. William's business activities fell into two categories. He, along with his brother Richard, were engaged in trade and money lending. They imported wine from Gascony, while wool and corn were exported, all of which took place in the background of war with Scotland. The war with Scotland presented William and Richard with an opportunity to become moneylenders. Defeats against the Scottish led to Scottish incursions into Northern England. Northern merchants like William saw an opportunity to profit through providing men and ships along with supplies needed for the campaign against Scotland. William and Richard went further and branched out into money lending. In 1320 they had made their first loan and by 1330 they had lent money across the kingdom. William and Richard's wealth allowed them to build up their portfolio of land and property in and around Hull. William acquired the manor of Mighton, which was to the north and west of Hull. He also acquired lands in Hesel, which included property at Heselwood and the quarry at Hesel itself, while Cottingham was temporarily under the control of both William and Richard. Richard helped finance the early building of the town's walls. Further afield, William's estates included Foston on the Walls and Nafferton. William and Richard also bought up plots of land within the town. They bought land along High Street, Low Gate, and land to the town's western edge, largely as investments and leased back to tenants. William also had property on Hull's High Street, known then as Hull Street. This was the residential quarter of Hull's wealthy merchants. And it was here that the hub of William and Richard's business activities took place, and no doubt would have been visited by a young Edward III on his visit to Hull in 1332. As leading merchants and political figures, it's not surprising that William and Richard became connected with central government. Richard, for example, became the king's chief butler, while William would later become Baron of the Exchequer. In 1327, William and Richard made their first loan to the king. William lent £4,000 for an expedition to Scotland. Repayment of this and other loans provided to the king by William and Richard was secured against customs at Hull and Boston, in which all revenue collected was to be paid to William and Richard until the loan was settled. William and Richard eventually split their business interests and went their separate ways in 1331. Richard relocated to London, while Hull remained William's base. The reason for the business separation 
was probably brought about by the birth of William's first son, Michael, as any inheritance between Richard and Michael would become an issue had the business partnership remained. William became more and more recognised politically. He was particularly influential in negotiations with Flanders, firstly to encourage Flemish weavers to settle in England. Beverley's Flemingate is named after those Flemish weavers who settled in the town. And secondly, with Edward III making a claim to the French throne, William's negotiations took on more importance to allow Edward III to land his army at Antwerp. William was also given authority over all customs in the land and one of the major sources of royal revenue. William was therefore doing rather well. He was now Hull's most important citizen. He represented Hull in Parliament and was the town's first mayor. William also acquired the great mansion house within the town of Hull, which became known as Suffolk Palace, which lay on the west side of Market Gate, now Low Gate, and remained the Delapole residence until the 16th century. William settled local disputes, one being to determine Sir John de Sutton's claim of exclusive passage over the River Hull at Drypole, while at the backdrop to all of this was William's mercantile activities, which made William a wealthy merchant in his own right. To top this off, he now exceeded his brother, Richard, in royal circles, when he became Baron of the Exchequer between 1339 and 1340. William was also knighted. As war continued with France, William once again became a royal moneylender. Edward III, however, required larger sums of money and William stepped into the breach. He, along with other merchants of the kingdom, monopolised the wool industry. This allowed English merchants to buy wool cheaply and sell it for greater profit abroad, essentially collapsing the wool market in the low countries, thus driving up its price overseas. The profit gained by the merchants allowed the king to borrow larger sums of money than previously. Loans to the king were once again secured against customs. In return, William also acquired additional estates, one being the royal manor at Bearswick in Holdness, much to the frustration of Edward III, owing to it being one of the most valuable royal estates at the time. However, things turned sour for William. In 1340, furious at his inability to finance his French campaign, Edward III took his frustration out on those financiers he felt responsible, including William Delaporte. William found himself imprisoned in the Tower of London before spending six months in Fleet Prison. Prosecution was brought against William and much of his land was seized, including at Bearstwick. Proceedings, however, were annulled as Edward once again required financial assistance. William once again stepped up and provided the funds. William did, however, take advantage of Edward's partial bankruptcy, which enabled him to recover some of the debts still owed to him. By 1345, William appears to have somewhat reduced his role in providing loans to Edward by withdrawing from one of his financing operations. To further compound Edward's woes, the Black Death ruined many English financiers, including those that had financed the Cressy campaign and the Siege of Calais. William, however, avoided responsibility for their debts, but he was not out the woods yet with some of his former associates continuing to hold William responsible. In the meantime, Edward managed to shake off his reliance on royal financiers and turned against William. The charges of wool smuggling threatened William with ruin. William escaped trial by remitting all outstanding royal debts and renouncing his claim to Bearstwick, which Edward had already confiscated. William, however, still retained some of his fortune. Politically, though, William's career was over. Now, in the later years of his life, certainly by medieval standards, he continued some business activities, but nowhere near previous levels. William eventually drew from business activities altogether. In his later years, William founded the Hospital for Poor Persons, which would be succeeded by the Carthusian Priory, established by his son in 1377, better known today as the Charter House. Today the building dates from 1780, but its initial concept was very much the brainchild of William Delapole. William died on the 21st of June 1366, most likely at Hull.
The town once familiar to William has changed over the centuries. Many of the old town streets still follow the original medieval layout of the late 13th and early 14th centuries. However, some street names have since changed. For example, in William's day, Whitefrigate was known as Oldgate, and High Street known as Hull Street, while Marketgate became Lowgate. The only buildings familiar to William today would be Holy Trinity and St Mary's Church. William would of course be familiar with the river or haven in which ships laden with wine, corn and wool would have berthed to load and unload under the watchful eye of merchants like William. A statue of William Delapole by Hull's Pier commemorates his legacy and importance to the early development of Hull. Whatever his origins, William was firmly a son of Hull. As a merchant, he, along with his brother Richard, brought about a shift in Hull's development. The town thrived and prospered under the Delapole brothers. However, as William witnessed, power and influence was fraught with danger, and this led to William's eventual fall from royal favour and into retirement. William's importance to Hull cannot be underestimated. Edward III's grandfather may have realised Hull's strategic importance when he acquired the town at the end of the 13th century, but William certainly helped exploit its economic development. William also laid the foundations for power and prosperity of the Delapole family for the next 200 years. His son Michael would surpass his father in the political arena, rising to the position of Chancellor. But unlike his father, Michael forged a military career, serving under Edward the Black Prince and John of Gaunt in the continuing wars with France. Descendants of Michael Delapole would too find royal favour. Some had close relationships with the king for which they would pay with their lives, while others such as John Delapole would become a threat to the crown, most notably the Tudors because of his blood ties with the House of York. But this, Michael Delapole and his descendants, is another story.